Thank you, Javita. What I'd like to do today is to talk to you a little bit about changing expectations in higher education. Um, there are some pretty significant changes that are underway in, uh, at this particular time, some of which have been be being developed for some time and some of which are very, very recent. And I want to talk about those and how they're impacting what we're doing at Georgia Tech. As Jovita said, we undertook the development of a strategic plan to try to understand what Georgia Tech might be like in 20 or 25 years. Fairly ambitious goal, but one that was uh, actually pretty easy because I told folks at the start they didn't have to worry uh, about it because we were going to be wrong for sure. Um, we weren't going to get it right. The, uh, uh, one only has to look at the news and what's happened in the past uh, several weeks in terms of the news at Georgia Tech to try to understand how these expectations are changing. Uh, see how, how these uh, changes are impacting uh, Georgia Tech. Just about three or four weeks ago, front page of the New York Times, an article uh, about the massive open online approach for a master's of science degree in computer science, a degree that for on-campus students would cost about $25,000, for out-of-state students would cost about $40,000, but we are trying to make that available to large numbers of students starting in January for about $7,000. That was on Sunday. On Thursday, President Barack Obama talked about Georgia Tech and some of the things that were going on in terms of uh, technology-assisted education. Uh, on Friday, Penny Pritzker, the Secretary of Commerce, was on campus looking at the Global Center for Medical Innovation to try to understand how we're taking products and commercializing those products. And then the following Monday, Anderson, three, Anderson Cooper on Anderson uh, Cooper 360 talked about STEM education and some of the things that Georgia Tech's doing in that arena. So higher education, the expectations for higher education are changing, and they're changing in three significant ways. The first way is when I went to uh, college, a lot of people went to college because it was the right thing to do. Getting more education, getting better educated was just a good thing. Today we see that our students are trying to pursue a college education because they actually want a job. We're a little concerned about that because we'd like to think that we prepare students for a career, not just for a job, but there's this tremendously strong focus today on whether or not students, when they fi finish college, are going to be able to get jobs and will be employable. Last October, just about a year ago, Time Magazine had a cover story about higher education. And one of the things that it said in that article was that 80% of the students that are attending college aren't sure it's worth it. And that's very depressing. Uh, especially for somebody in my line of work where the, the, uh, you like to think the students are, are uh, very excited, uh, very uh, energ energized about the potential, their future, and what the world holds for them in the years to come. But today there's this strong focus on trying to make sure that students are in fact employable. And we're doing a couple of things at Georgia Tech to try to make sure that happens. We're trying to revitalize the way we think about undergraduate education. We've established a center for 21st century universities. This was an outgrowth of our strategic plan to try to understand what universities might be like in the future. We're using technology-assisted learning in a big way, something we've been doing for a long time, but certainly the focus today is much, much greater than it has been in the past. We're talking about flipped classrooms. These are classrooms where instead of going to the classroom and having the faculty member lecture, the students watch the lecture online beforehand and then go to class and actually have some discussion, talk about what occurred in the lecture, uh, and uh, share some of their thoughts and ideas. Service learning is playing a huge role for us. We've uh, initiated or in the process of initiating a new degree program called the X degree, a degree where students can actually design their own undergraduate degree, where they can come in, tell us what series of courses they put together, they want to put together, to try to create their own degree. We think that this will allow us to try to see ahead into the future. If we were doing this 15 years ago, we might have, um, might have uh, had, a, had a better handle on bioinformatics, this combination of biology and computer science, or of nanotechnology, the combination of mechanical engineering and physics, and some of those areas. We are focusing on student innovation, both leadership and innovation, and heavily focused on what we can do to try to ensure that the students are innovative and creative. Uh, we fo a stronger focus on the capstone design project, uh, what we call invention studio, where students can go and work on their ideas, try to take their inventions, their ideas, and make inventions, and then those inventions and turn them into products, and those products into businesses. 
The Inventor Prize, probably the most exciting thing we're doing. About four years ago, four and a half years ago, we started a competition where our students come together and they actually compete with a business plan. We had 400 entries last year. The students uh, competed. They did a written business plan at first, and then we down-selected to eight finalists. Uh, we do it in the first theater. It's broadcast on Georgia Public Broadcasting, and it's really like uh, American Idol for geeks is what the students call it. It's uh, instead of dancing or performing or singing, the students show a four, four or five minute video that they've made ahead of time. They do a four or five minute live presentation to a panel of judges and answer questions. Those students then, uh, the, uh, the judges select the winner. First prize is $20,000, second prize is $15,000, but most importantly is that first and second prize get a commitment from our Pro Office of Intellectual Property to help them commercialize their product. And for three of the past four years, the first place winner from the previous year's product was available by the next year's competition. The, uh, uh, it, it seems to be working. Uh, Georgia Tech has consistently ranked in the top three in terms of return on investment. And just recently, the Wall Street Journal reported Georgia Tech was number one in terms of return on investment. The second area where expectations are changing is the expectation that we will take the research that we do in our laboratories and move that into commercial products. Move, commercialize that in information, commercialize that intellectual property, create new jobs or create new businesses and create new jobs. The, uh, uh, we divided our research into 12 core areas, which what we like to think of as the grand challenges, things like big data, uh, water, electronics and nanotechnology, and we focused it so that people can access the information that we have in a more readily understandable fashion. The Tech Square, now this is an area just across the connector uh, from Georgia Tech on 5th Street, kind of centered on 5th Street. The groundbreaking for Tech Square was September 6, 2001. And if you look right in the center of the screen, the pointer isn't going to work here, but right in the center of the screen, there's a red brick building there. That's the Crum and Forrester building. Look at that building. The bridge right there in the lower right-hand corner is the 5th Street Bridge, but watch that building. This is the construction. See the building back there kind of hidden between those two white ones? And then this is the, as it exists today. We've created, and you can see the Crum and Forrester building back there uh, just kind of dwarfed. The building closest on the right side is the Hotel and Conference Center. Across the street is the Scheller College of Business. And then to the left is the Synergy Building where we have a startup uh, incubator. It's the Advanced Technology, and Development Corp, uh, Corp, Cent, Advanced Technology and Development Center that's hosting 40 startup companies to try to help our faculty, our staff, our students, people from the state of Georgia, to try to help them take their ideas, create inventions, and turn those inventions into products and those products into businesses. We will celebrate the 10-year anniversary of Tech Square the first or second week of October. The... Uh, other thing that's uh, happening there is this creation of an innovation zone, a zone where entrepreneurs and people that have ideas can come together, bring those ideas, share those ideas, talk about how you develop a startup company, how you get started, and we provide support through the, um, through the Advanced Technology Development Center. AT&T announced the opening of their foundry uh, just a couple of weeks ago. It's one of four in the country, or four in the world. They have one in Plano, which is where their headquarters is. They have one in Mountain View, California, one in Tel Aviv, and now one here in Atlanta in Tech Square. It's an organization or a group of people from AT&T Mobility that are coming together trying to access the human capital, the ideas, the research at Georgia Tech to develop new mobile solutions. Some of the other things that are happening, uh, we've got uh, the ATDC, which I mentioned, works with about 300 businesses around the state to try to help them access the expertise in research that we have at Georgia Tech. It was named as one of 12 business incubators that's changing the world. And the Venture Lab is uh, another activity that we have. Um, as shown here, ATDC, in conjunction with the v Venture Lab, launched 140 companies and attracted $2 billion in investments. The Venture Lab was recently named one of the uh, uh, incubators that's changing the world. It's ranked number two globally by the University Business Incubators, uh, an organization that looks at college or university-based incubators around the world. So all of these activities that are occurring there in Tech Square in Midtown Atlanta are designed to address this second changing expectation, which is trying to take 
ideas and trying to take the research that we do at Georgia Tech and move that research into the business community. The most recent one we have is called TechStarter. You can invest in new companies at Georgia Tech. You go to www.starter.gotech.edu and you can see seven companies that are startup companies, ideas for companies that students, faculty, and staff have developed and you can invest in it. So it's a crowdsource investment process, something that's really new. It's, uh, there's several of these types of things, crowdsourcing platforms that exist, but this is one of the first ones that allows individuals from around the world to invest in startup companies based at Georgia Tech. The third area where the expectations are changing is in this idea that it used to be okay for institutions like Georgia Tech to be good regional institutions, and then it was necessary for them to be truly great national institutions, and now we're expected to be global. And in addition to being a global institution, we're also expected to try and educate the world and probably do it for almost free. Uh, we've got a strategy that was developed as part of this strategic planning process uh, to expand the footprint at Georgia Tech. We want to make sure that our students are good global citizens, that they understand the world around them, and that they can contribute to that world in a host of different ways, that they can embrace and support the changing global environment, that they're engaged through service projects or other types of activities that take them around the world, expose them to all of the things that are happening around the world and give them an opportunity to help change the world. The, uh, uh, ac these activities cover a whole host of activities, but probably one of the most important ones is for us to be able to provide an opportunity for our students to study abroad or do an international internship. Probably one of the biggest changes that I see in education today versus 25 or 35 years ago is the, how well informed our students are about what's going on in the world. When I was a freshman in college, I knew what was going on in Southeast Asia, but I didn't know very much about what was going on around the rest of the world. The students today are very well connected. They know what's going on. They have a world interest, a global view, a global perspective, and our goal is to try to expand that. And we're doing it a number of different ways. We have a campus, well, not really a campus, but a presence in a number of places around the world. We have campuses or a presence in France where we have actually two buildings. Uh, we have some residence halls there, and we have 250 students a year that study, or I'm sorry, 250 students a semester that study at our campus in Metz, France, in the Lorraine region. They go over, they spend some time there, they spend a semester, um, they come back. At one point, not too many years ago, I was under the impression that having a group of students from a university that go abroad and take a course from an instructor from that university with other students from that university was not really a global experience or an international experience. And I was wrong because so much of the time that the students spend is outside of the classroom trying to understand the culture, trying to understand the environment. Um, trying to get a little different perspective. And for those of you that travel internationally, it's really interesting when you first travel internationally and you watch the news from somewhere else looking into the United States or looking into America rather than being in America and looking out. And that's a real mind-opening or eye-opening experience for our students. We also have a presence in uh, several places in China, in Sh Singapore, in Panama, in Costa Rica, in Ireland. We have a research center. And again, primarily to allow our students to have an international experience that can help them become good global citizens and understand the world around them. Today, about 43% of our undergraduate students participate in some sort of meaningful international experience before they graduate. That is a huge number for public institutions. Most public institutions, that number is 5 to 8%. As part of our strategic plan, we talked about whether or not we should require a meaningful international experience before our students graduate and decided not to do that because it may not be the right thing for every student. But what we want to do is to provide an opportunity for a meaningful international experience for every one of our students. The uh, next area that I want to talk about and kind of the last one is this concept of technology-assisted learning or MOOCs, Massive Open Online Courses. Again, we did a strategic plan just four years ago to understand what Georgia Tech might be like in 20 or 25 years, and we never talked about MOOCs. We hadn't even heard about MOOCs at that time. 
About 18 months ago, we offered our first massive open online course. We offered five courses and had 20,000 students sign up the first day. These are courses for free. We don't charge anything. Anybody can take them. There are no guidelines. Uh, but they do provide an opportunity for students to learn something. You know, these, this idea of technology-assisted learning is going to change the way we think about education. And it's going to change the way we think about education in a couple fairly significant ways. One, it's going to change the concept of timing. Uh, we started the semester five weeks ago. We start in August and end in May. Why? So, they can so that students can go home and plant crops in the spring and harvest them in the fall. Um, we don't have a lot of students that are doing that these days. The other change that's going to happen is how we view success. One of the things you hear people talk about, Magnus er Eggerstadt's robotics course, 40,000 students enrolled in it, but only about 10% of them completed the course. People say, well, only 10% of these students actually complete these courses. That's okay. There's, if there were 5,000 students out of the 40,000 that just listened to two lectures, then that's 5,000 students that know more today than they did before they listened to the lectures. And so it's going to change this concept of success, where we today think of success as a 15-week block, you have to finish the whole thing, and you get a grade, and that's success. But this is learning for learning's sake. The other area where we're heavily engaged and involved is this idea of K-12 through outreach. And you might wonder, why does Georgia Tech, an institution without, uh, we don't have a college of education, why are we interested in K-12 through outreach? Well, it's because that provides the raw material for us. We have to make sure that we have students that are, that, that are well-educated in science and math, uh, well-educated through middle school, school through high school. And we have over 30 programs in a center that we call Seismic, the Center for Enhancing uh, and Integrating Science, Math, and Computing. It's a, program, a series of programs for middle school and high school teachers and for middle school and high school students, mostly middle school. They have an opportunity to understand that science can be fun. We've got a program direct to, Dis direct to discovery where students in Ware County and Houston County can access our laboratories through high-speed, high-bandwidth internet and actually talk to our researchers, have a have a one-on-one uh, -on -one conversation, an exchange, and we're trying to spread that across the state. Project Engage is a program we have with the Best Academy and the Coretta Scott King uh, School over in the uh, West Side neighborhoods to try to get those students to be able to come to Georgia Tech while they're in middle school and participate in some sort of educational or research activity. Again, to try to help them understand that science can be fun. It's not a whole bunch of 60-year-old guys in white shirts and slide rules and uh, pocket protectors, but it can be fun and exciting. When I talk to our students, particularly young women, at the freshman convocation when they're first coming to Georgia Tech, one of the questions I often ask them is, why did you come to Georgia Tech? And the response is typically, I came to a summer camp when I was younger and was really excited. And that's incredibly important. Today, if you don't get in the advanced math track in eighth grade, then you are challenged to try to go to an institution like Georgia Tech because you have to take Algebra 1 in the 8th grade, Geometry in ninth grade, Algebra 2, Pre-Calculus, and then Calculus while you're your senior year. So there's this whole series of courses that you have to line up. We're involved in many aspects, aspects of science education, aspects of technology, aspects of engineering, and are anxious to try to make sure that we can meet these changing expectations in higher education today. You may recognize that picture in the upper right-hand corner. That's Nick Selby. Uh, he went viral with his uh, welcome to the freshman students. If you haven't seen it, go on YouTube, uh, type in Nick Selby, and he'll get you fired up. Thanks very much.